Before we look at Ezekiel 21, we'll be picking up in verse 22. But before we do that, please join me in prayer. Father, we thank you for um, our little fellowship, our little family of believers, brothers and sisters in the Lord who, have, who share not blood, but the blood of Christ. We share that. And we have a unity in your grace and the need for it. We have a unity at the cross. We have the unity in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We have a unity in your truth, the Bible. And now we ask that you would give us wisdom and understanding of your word. Open our eyes and our minds and our ears to your word and may it sink in deeply. And whatever we're reading, whether we're in the Old Testament or the New Testament, Lord, it is all breathed out by you and it is all profitable so that we might be equipped and able to do every good thing that you've put before us to do. Bless our time in your word together and use it to encourage us, convict us, direct us and help us to be more like Christ in whose name we pray. Amen. You remember last time we left off that you had King Nebuchadnezzar is coming to a crossroads and he needs to decide if he's going to go attack the Ammonites or if he's going to go and attack Jerusalem. And so in order to decide, he seeks the counsel of the one true Lord. No, he doesn't. No, he doesn't. He does what any good pagan would do and he consults the livers. He consults the pagan gods by doing different pagan rituals to find out from these gods which way he should go. And so we kind of left off there last time, and so we're picking up where we left off, and here he's going to be making his decision to go to Jerusalem. He's going to think that his decision was made by himself with the aid of the help of these pagan gods. But I would hope that each and every one of you, within the sound of my voice, understands that his decision was not his own. It was God using him to fulfill what God had decreed. So, let's see what God's word has to say for us today. Ezekiel 21, verse 22. Into his right hand comes the divination for Jerusalem. So there's his answer. Into his right hand comes the divination for Jerusalem to set battering rams to open the mouth with murder to lift up the voice with shouting, to set battering rams against the gates, to cast up mounds, to build siege towers. But to them, it will seem like a false divination. They have sworn solemn oaths, but he brings their guilt to remembrance that they may be taken. So what's verse 22 and 23 saying then? Well, on the right hand, divination for Jerusalem is his answer, Nebuchadnezzar's answer to which way he should go. At that crossroads, Nebuchadnezzar decides to go to Jerusalem. And he's going to go there with his battering rams, with his siege towers, and there is going to be a great slaughter. He is going to heap up a siege mound. So this is just kind of God foretelling, this is what's going to happen. This is what's going to happen when King Nebuchadnezzar arrives at Jerusalem. This is also, you might say, okay, yeah, God is saying that. But God is, is actually adding some specifics here that you might not realize. He's not declaring or prophesying that there's going to be a big open field battle, is he? He's not mentioning that at all. Matter of fact, in ancient times, you would rarely have big open fought battles on a battlefield unless you had two armies that were relatively similar. Two armies that felt like they could fight one another sword for sword. If you didn't think you could muster enough guys and have an equal fair fight, well then, what would you do? If the army coming against you is far larger than your own, what would you do? If you had a big city like Jerusalem with high walls, you would retreat into the city. So here God is foretelling quite accurately, and I'll, I'll tell you this, every time God foretells something, guess what? He has a 100% win streak he is always right he is always accurate and because that's because he decrees what is to happen god's not guessing so god is saying that this is going to be a siege the armies of jerusalem are not going to go out on the field of battle and meet sword to sword against nebuchadnezzar and the babylonians no they're going to retreat within the walls of jerusalem and so nebuchadnezzar is going to bring his battering rams and his siege towers and that's going to be how it happens that's what God is saying here. And then it says in verse 20, it will seem to them like a false divination. Now, what's happening here is that there's going to be a falsehood here in the sense that though Nebuchadnezzar seeks pagan gods and pagan practices to decide 
by divination which way he should go, it's really God who is deciding which way he should go. So that's what it means by there will, it will seem to them like a false divination. Nebuchadnezzar is going to think it's, it was these pagan gods who helped him out when really it was the one true God that made his decision up for him. You also have the idea of it being a false divination from the standpoint of Jerusalem. So from Nebuchadnezzar's standpoint, it's a false divination because he's giving the credit to false gods, to pagan idols, pagan gods, pagan practices. So in that sense, it's a false divination in the mind of Nebuchadnezzar. So in the mind of the people in Jerusalem, they're saying, nah, this isn't going to happen. No, couldn't possibly be. Uh, this can't be true. This, this will fail. So in their minds, it's false in that regard, you see. And that talks about those who have sworn oaths. This is talking about Zedekiah, the nobles and the princes who swore allegiance to the king of Babylon first. You remember that. They swear allegiance to the king of Babylon, and then after swearing allegiance to the king of Babylon, turn around and go, hey, Egypt, how would you like to help us with Babylon? So they break their oaths that they have sworn in the presence of the Lord. So they perjured themselves. They dishonored God by breaking the oath they swore in the name of God. And not only that, they made Nebuchadnezzar so angry that now he's coming against them. So that's what those first two verses are saying. Verse 24, Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have made your guilt to be remembered and that your transgressions are uncovered, so that in all your deeds your sins appear, because you have come to remembrance, you shall be taken in hand. And you, O profane wicked one, prince of Israel, whose day has come, the time of your final punishment, thus says the Lord God, remove the turban, Take off the crown. These things shall not remain as they are. Exalt that which is low, and bring low that which is exalted. A ruin, 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 I will make it. If God says something three times, you better believe. That's not just because he's like, hey, I need to really make sure that you understand it's going to be a ruin. He's talking about the severity of the ruin. Three times is not just, hey, this is important. It also means this is severe. The ruin, it's, it's highlighting the amount of ruin. Yes, this is important because he's repeating it three times, but it's also highlighting how severe the ruin will be by being highlighted three times. A ruin, 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 I will make it. It's God's decision. This isn't Nebuchadnezzar's. Remember, God is the swordsman. Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon are the sword. God is deciding where that sword strikes. He says, a ruin, 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 I will make it. This also shall not be until he comes, the one to whom judgment belongs, and I will give it to him. So because you have made your iniquity or sins to be remembered. So in other words, because Judas sinned so memorably. Oh, you sinned very, very well. You sinned in such a way that God remembers it. It's at the forefront of God's mind. You really offended God. God's going to therefore remember you in judgment. That's all he's saying there. You, uh, you might be hoping that God forgot about what you've done or that Nebuchadnezzar forgot about what you did. You might have thought, well, you know, maybe King Nebuchadnezzar forgot that we turned our backs on him and went to Egypt and forsook our oaths. Maybe God forgot about all those sins and all those idolatrous things that we've done. And what is this telling you? Neither did Nebuchadnezzar forget, and neither will God forget. So he says, now to you, wicked prince of Israel. This is, this, is, uh, this is what happens over decades of persistent wicked sin. Persistent sin leads to a hardening of the people. It matters what you think and what you do. Nothing shall remain the same. There, judgment is coming. Judgment is coming, Zedekiah. Remove the turban, take off the crown. Those, those are emblems or symbols, the crown of kingship, the turban of the priesthood. Nothing shall remain. You're going to be humbled. The low brought high and the high brought low. The high priest was the one who wore the turban according to Exodus 28. 
So in the crown, of course, is referencing the king. So God is saying the system in Israel and Jerusalem is coming down. Nothing will remain the same. You are going to be set aside. Overthrown, overthrown. I will make it overthrown. Fallen, fallen, fallen. Ruined, ruined, ruined. Again, great emphasis here. This is also repeated three times because guess how many times Nebuchadnezzar comes and invades? Three times. You got it. God is making sure that they understand you cannot escape judgment. This is why we as believers today have an urgency in sharing the gospel because no one can escape judgment. Not you, not I, not the people that are being talked about here in Ezekiel 21, nor anyone in between, nor anyone in the future from today. No one can escape judgment. That is the point that's being made here. No one can mock God and get away with it. No one can sin and run their own lives and think that they're not going to have to pay the piper one day. God is God, after all. He does not forget. And such a terrifying truth that we're reading here in Ezekiel should drive you to your knees in repentance. What must I do to be made right with such a God who I cannot compete with, who I cannot contend with, who I cannot appease, who I can't fool, who I can't talk my way out of this, I can't buy my way out of this. That's the point, is you're seeing God's holiness, his faithfulness, his judgment. Later on, you'll see his mercy and his love. But you're seeing God in all his attributes on display here, and so the result should be the fear of God being put into you, which is then the beginning of wisdom in the sense that it leads you to contrition, a heart of contrition, desiring to be made right with God. And then you look to God's word to find out how is that possible. And you know the answer. There is only one way, one truth, and one life. It is Jesus Christ who is the answer. Faith in God. In the Old Testament, it's faith in God. In the New Testament, it's still faith in God, but in the revealed God who is Jesus Christ. All this is until he who comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Zedekiah, you're, you're the last of a long line. Until, guess who? When I say until, so the crown goes away, turban goes away, the way things are goes away until he comes whose right it is, and I will give it to him. Guess who that's talking about? Guess who God is foretelling the coming of right there in Ezekiel 21? Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Until he comes. And this isn't his first advent that's being referenced here. Because was Jesus made king in his first advent? No. He's crucified. It's in his second coming. His second advent. That's when he, the true son of God, the true son of David, that's when he will come and he will fulfill all these things. That's what Jesus Christ will do. He's the one who comes, whose right it is to take the throne, to take the crown. So this is a great Old Testament messianic promise. They're all over the place, although this one is quite often overlooked. This is really hopeful. This is the only hope that Judah has. That God will send his son, none other than his son, to rule over his people. I'm done playing with you. This is done. And nothing is going to come until I send my son to take it because he's the only one who has the right. From Zedekiah down to our Lord, God and Savior, Jesus Christ, there has been no one in the line of David who has sat on the throne. So until Christ comes back again, there has been no one, nor will there be anyone, to sit on the throne. That right belongs to Jesus Christ alone. And God is telling you that's his decree. So guess what? That's exactly how it's going to happen. Ezekiel is saying that not only will no one do so, no one can do so. Because God has said this is how it's going to be. 
So this is also helpful for us to understand that when God says something, take it to the bank. God says that there is going to be no one else who sits on the throne of Israel until my son, the Savior and Messiah, Jesus Christ, comes. And he's not even referring to, again, he's not referring to his first coming. He's talking to his second coming. So you know that you can take that to the bank. That's exactly how it's going to happen. Everything else God has foretold has already come to pass. So if, if, if there's something that hasn't come to pass yet that God foretold, that just means it's not happened yet. But you can count that it, on, that it will happen. When he comes back, all of his enemies will be made his footstool. This is what we can look forward to, and this is what the people of Israel can look forward to. Verse 28. And you, son of man, prophesy and say, thus says the Lord God concerning the Ammonites and concerning their reproach. Say, a sword, a sword is drawn for the slaughter. It is polished to consume and to flash like lightning. While they see you for you false visions, while they divine lies for you, to place you on the wrecks of the profane and wicked whose day has come, the time of their final punishment, return it to its sheath. In the place where you were created, in the land of your origin, I will judge you, and I will pour out my indignation upon you. I will blow upon you with the fire of my wrath, and I will deliver you into the hands of brutish men, skillful to destroy. You shall be fuel for the fire. Your blood shall be in the midst of the land. You shall be no more remembered, for I, the Lord, have spoken. That's God speaking to a different people. He's speaking to the Ammonites. Remember at that crossroads, Nebuchadnezzar was deciding, hmm, who should I go and subjugate? Should I go to Jerusalem or should I go to the Ammonites? So God talks about the people in Jerusalem and now he's talking about the people in, or the people of the Ammonites. When God said that Nebuchadnezzar would stand at the parting of the roads and be guided by God to go to Jerusalem, it does not mean that God's not going to bring judgment against the Ammonites. The Ammonites are descendants of Lot, Abraham's nephew. And quite soon afterwards, they had always been kind of a thorn in the side of the Jewish people, a thorn in the side of Israel. They were almost always at the necks of Israel. Now they're going to pay the price. They mocked and mistreated Judah and Jerusalem and Israel And now God is going to use the same sword he uses to punish Jerusalem and Israel. He's going to use that same sword against the Ammonites. There is no one who escapes God's judgment, do you see? Do you see? There's no one who escapes it. Babylon, even though it's being used by God to be a sword for judgment against his people, Babylon's not even going to get excluded from judgment. God's going to judge them for what they do to Israel. No one escapes judgment. No one. No one. This prophecy about the Ammonites is fulfilled about five years after the taking of Jerusalem. He says, a sword, a sword is drawn. So this sword of judgment, this is, context hasn't changed, right? We, when we talk about understanding the Bible and interpreting it rightly, context is so important. And in the midst of Ezekiel 21, the context has not changed. So when we have a reference of a sword yet again in Ezekiel 21, you know it's talking about the same kind of judgment. Judgment, judgment is going to come against the Ammonites. This is God promising that. He's promising that. There's a difference, though. Unlike Israel, they have no hope. Israel at least had a hope for a future because God says, no one's going to sit on your throne until I send the Messiah to do so. The one who who's, has the right to take it. So at least they have a hope for the future, right? That one little thing that God says shows that, look, somehow, some way, Israel will persist and survive until the Messiah comes to fulfill that prophecy. Yes? So at least they have that hope. The Ammonites, they don't get that hope, okay? They're told just the opposite. You're going to disappear as a people. That's what God is saying. I mean, if, if God's judgment is so severe upon those who, who know him, do you understand how severe his punishment is upon those who do not? This really sets the tone of the seriousness of idolatry and sin. God tells the Ammonites, I will blow against you. 
I'm going to destroy you utterly. When you, when you have a fire and you want that fire to heat up even hotter, what do you do? You blow on it. That's what God is saying. I'm going to blow on you. I'm going to destroy you. And when my fire of my judgment comes, I'm going to blow on it, figuratively speaking, in order to make it even hotter and more destructive. When he says, return your short sword to its sheath, he's talking about the Ammonites. Don't resist Babylon. Don't bother. You're going to be... You're going to be destroyed regardless. Don't bother. So you see what God's really saying there. Don't even bother. Your, your destiny is written, Ammonites. I have judged you. My wrath is going to be poured out upon you, and you have no hope of survival. So don't even bother to take your sword out of your sheath. That's what God is saying there. You're not going to be remembered Israel has a future, but the Ammonites do not. No mercy from God for them. And that is God's holy, sovereign prerogative. To give mercy upon whom he shall give mercy. That's what he says in Romans 9. That's what he says to Moses. I will have mercy upon whom I will have mercy. Paul uses that as the argument for God's sovereign will in Romans 9. Their ultimate fate, the Ammonites, is worse than Israel. They will no longer be remembered. This is, this is meant to strike terror and fear. This is not meant for you to go, well, boy, God, aren't you being a little harsh? Well, boy, God, aren't you just, uh, you know, maybe take it down a notch or two there, God? Are you a little angry? Did you, get, you, got a, you got a sliver in your, in your foot or something that's making you cranky? Are you hangry? Come on, God, that's not meant, that's not the reaction God is going for in his word here. The reaction God is going for in his word here is be terrified of falling into the judgment of the Lord. It's a call to repentance. And they have ignored the call to repentance so much that now there is no chance for repentance. It's just talking about God's judgment. This is why there's a sense of urgency that we have to share the gospel with God, who God has put around us. Because we need to tell them of the danger that they're in because of their sin. And then we need to be able to tell them of the one way out in and through Jesus Christ. Please pray with me and then I have something I'd like to say. Heavenly Father, please help us in this short little Section of Ezekiel 21, we have been made to see your wrath and your justice, your judgment, which is always true and perfect. You are the perfect judge. And Lord, that makes us to fear you with a holy reverential fear. And we pray that you would use that to increase our thankfulness and gratefulness towards you for your salvation through faith alone in Jesus Christ alone, and that you would use that fear to motivate us to share your gospel with great courage, to warn people of sin, to call them to repentance and to faith in Jesus Christ so that they might have a future. Father, help us to do this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.